I'm sure a lot of folks are starting to think about the application process. Do you want to share just a little bit about your background and what you do? Sure. So I'm realizing now it's been about 20 years since I graduated from law school. <laughs> and uh, since that time, I've been working in law school admissions. So I started by being director of admissions at different law schools. And then I started Law School Expert in 2004. So for 16 years, all I've done is help people through the process. I became very inspired to help people do it right after seeing so many people make just fatal errors in their applications um, and using what I knew of the process and what law schools value and the methodology behind it, um, I decided to put that to work for students, um, for applicants. So in that time, I've helped literally thousands. I, um, I have, uh, I'm the author of the Law School Admission Game, which is in its third iteration, and the Law School Decision Game, which is a little outdated and could probably be reworked, but a book about uh, whether to go to law school. But most of my experience is not in that. My experience is once you've made the decision to help you get there. Great, great. Thanks for, thanks for the background. And so sure. once you made the decision to go to law school and let's say you're like most applicants right now, you're about three months or two months out before applications open, what should folks be doing now, whether they, they are done with the LSAT or not, or if they're not sure whether they're done with the LSAT, yeah. what do they do? What well, do they do now at this point? I think the first thing is to figure out a plan A, knowing that plan B and C is totally fine too. Okay, I think people put way too much pressure on themselves to do things on the first timeline. For example, I just got off the phone with a client who was so dead set on taking July and applying in September early, but now we're talking about how maybe that's not what's best for her, and she's you know she's kind of freaking out like, but this wasn't the plan. It's okay to change the plan if in the end it's going to get you the best results. So ideally, if someone has the LSAT behind them, I would want them to do their applications by the end of September, unless they're applying to Yale. That one doesn't come out quite till October 1st or so. Um, but for the rest of them, have them done by then, which means now is the time to ask and get letters of rec, to work on all of your written materials that you can predict. Uh, some of them you won't know till you see the applications themselves, but certainly resume, personal statement, addenda can all be addressed. Um, and for people who have the LSAT in front of them, definitely letters of rec, uh, transcripts to LSAC, those are the first two uh, things I have anyone do because they're the longest lead time items. And they're also the things that are beyond the control um, in, of your own hands. <laughs> so you have to trust others. And so it requires a little more managing, a little more uh, time. And then from there, I usually um, have people, when they start thinking about their own materials, actually start with their resume. Um, a lot of people think, well, I have a resume. What's the big deal? But this is a different kind of a resume. And I talk a lot about that in the book too, which by the way, not here to sell books. It's uh, available on Spotify audio version and Kindle Unlimited. So, um, but the, the law school admission game, I really lay out why the resume is important and why that's a good place to start. And then moving on to evaluating what you think your strengths and weaknesses are. So you kind of know where you might want to focus your personal statement. Thanks for the rundown. So I was interested to hear about the, the transcripts issue because I don't normally hear a lot about that. We always hear letters of rec, ask for those early, but transcripts, I mean, what's the deal? Is that, is that universities are kind of quiet over the summer or just that they're a big bureaucracy? No, they, they take a while for LSAC to process. And also, I remember a lot of people have international transcripts. Um, and some people start the process not really aware that all of their transcripts really do need to be sent to LSAC. And so it can be very frustrating later when people apply and then LSAC flags them and says, wait, you took three credits at Berkeley during your summer vacation and, you know, or you know, during your senior year of high school and you didn't submit that. So that can delay things. So it's better to do it from the beginning. Plus the law schools uh, consider your LSAC GPA, not the one on your college transcript necessarily. So they don't compute that GPA until they have all of your transcripts. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Now you mentioned that the law school resume should look a little bit different from the traditional, I guess, work oh. resume. How does it differ? Well, there's a few ways. You have to remember that there's not a lot of space, if any, on a law school application to explain how you've spent your time in college and post-college. Um, so for example, you might be able, some schools do have you enter the job nuts and bolts, where you worked, what dates, what your position was, but that's it. It doesn't get, to, you don't get to say what you did, what you responsibilities were, how much you worked. Uh, the resume lets you do that. It lets you talk about your undergraduate activities, accomplishments, um, it's really the only space within the application to present all of that. And 
uh, there's no reason it has to be one page. There's no reason you have to take off things that you think are irrelevant for a job you might be applying for. The law schools really want to see how you spent your time. All of it brings value uh, and perspective. You know, some people think, well, I, why do they care? They don't care that, I'm, that I was helping a caterer on weekends during college. But yes, they do. I mean, that's grunt work. That shows responsibility. That shows... Um, you know, you're willing to hustle. That shows you have some understanding of financial realities. So yes, those are important things that you may not include on a regular resume that you would for law school. Right. Interesting. Because I, it's also, I suppose, you don't want to have gaps, right? A gap on a resume versus a grunt work job. Well, I'm not so concerned about gaps. I think gaps are kind of natural, depending on especially when you graduated and what the economy was like. And I think gaps are more forgivable now than they were 10 years ago. Um, but to me, it's less about that and more about um, just accounting for your time, showing what you've done with it. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. What, well, I guess what comes to mind is that I, I work with a lot of applicants who do have gaps for various reasons. And yeah. I'm wondering what length of time, what time period would warrant perhaps an addendum of some kind to explain if it was one month versus let's say yeah. six months. Well, never a month, but I think it depends on where the person is in their life. I mean, if you're talking about someone in their forties who took time off to have children, I might have them account for that in a personal section on their resume, for example, or if it's, or, or sometimes I have people put a little asterisk um, on the resume to explain, uh, you know, from uh, July through September, 2019 studied for the LSAT um, and traveled something like that because some schools do ask to account for any gaps three months or longer. Um, but for some people, it may not be important. It's really case by case, but it's certainly nothing I would want people to angst over. I think by accounting for your time, what I really mean is giving yourself credit for the things you've done, you know, account for if you were a work study during college, how many hours a week, if you worked at Starbucks, you know, before grad school, how, you know, how many hours a week, like, or while going to school or while having family responsibilities, you know, law schools want people who, um, want to know that you're capable of taking care of a lot at once. And so those kinds of details help with that, even if you think the job itself isn't prestigious. Right. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for clearing that up. One question that comes to mind this year in particular with the transition towards the digital LSAT is that in July, LSAC is giving applicants to cancel their scores. They're giving them incentives yes. to do so. Or the option to, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only after seeing it. After they, they can see their score before deciding whether to right. cancel but they're also giving them somewhat of an incentive to do so by giving them a free retake on a future LSAT administration. So I'm wondering how that might change how applicants should explain a potential score cancellation. And this is always an, I know this is always a question, what to explain, what not to explain, what to draw attention to, what not to draw attention to, but I'm wondering how you think admission officers might look at cancellations on the July LSAT in particular. Okay, so I want to, add, I'm going to answer that for you, but I'm going to add in what you didn't ask me that I think applies to whether someone should take this July LSAT, because it seems all indications are why not take it, but there's one exception to that, I believe, but let's, let's put that on hold as the hook, and um, I generally believe that a cancellation is not something to explain in a law school application. It's just par for the course. It's no big deal. It's probably a good judgment call. Leave it alone. It has no impact whatsoever. If someone took the LSAT four times and there's three cancellations, that doesn't show great judgment, so that might be something I might want to explain have someone explain or, or talk someone through, but I generally, a cancellation to me is like, just leave it alone. Don't angst over it. It's probably a good judgment call. Walk away, especially this time around. Like, don't, don't explain it. But a lot of people are saying, you know, if a lot of my clients are saying, if, if there's no downside to taking the July LSAT, but I do believe there's one downside, which is a lot of my clients get very agitated and emotional when they see scores that are not in line with their potential and their hopes and their dreams. And so if someone really hasn't put in the work to get practice test scores that they would be happy with on the real test day, I, and that person is a naturally anxious person or pretty hard on themselves, I actually think it can be demoralizing to see a low score, even if you can cancel it. Um, and if, if you're, and also if you're one of those people, if you're, it's your first time taking the LSAT, you might be taking it on paper and you won't really know till you walk in that day 
that can be disconcerting too if you've practiced digitally and then so you're taking it a different way. And so is that really indicative of what you would do since it's not how you practiced? So, I mean, these are little nitpicky things. In the end, it's not the end of the world to take the July LSAT, walk away from it, cancel your score. But I don't necessarily think it means everyone should take it either. If you haven't prepped, if you're not ready, like just wait a little bit, let them get this, let them get the, uh, the cobwebs out of the experiment mm -hmm. and then go in confident once you've seen what other people say and once you've seen more practice tests. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, one thing I don't love about the July LSAT is the ambiguity around which Correct. format you're going to get. That is surprise. Uh, yeah, that, that is that is somewhat nerve wracking, understandably so. And I wouldn't want to be in that position, which is why at least LSAC is giving those olive branches to make it a little bit smoother for folks. Yeah, and it's an exciting time to be applying to law school because of these changes. And I think we're going to be talking in a moment, I assume, about some of those other changes and both the good and bad uh, aspects for applicants, but. Uh, generally, this is a pretty exciting time. Um, LSAC is finally coming into the current century, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that flows, but they're offering a lot of incentives and resources like Khan Academy, et cetera, and so I think that's really encouraging for applicants. Yeah, they're really trying to update themselves for the 21st century and catch up with the GRE and compete, and so they've made a lot of changes that are nice to see. The Khan Academy is one, transitioning towards digital is two as well, so it's, it's nice to see that these changes are finally happening, even though they're long overdue. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of these other LSAT changes coming around the bend. I guess one of them that recently just made the news a couple, like a week or so ago, was these new LSAT retake limits. Have you heard about yes. those at all? Yes, yes. So uh, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but basically starting in September, your grandfather didn't before then, take the LSAT as many times as you wish, but starting in September, uh, it's three test administrations in a year. Uh, and they count the year mid-year to mid-year, somehow spring to spring. And it's five times in three years, something like that. I mean, it might yeah, be five times in three I, years. I pulled it up myself just to double yeah, check. It's something is like that. But basically what it is, is, um, I mean, it's not as restrictive as it was before, where it was three times in two years, three, and that's it. Um, so this is, uh, this is more generous, uh, especially with more frequent, Opt opportunities to take the exam. Um, I think this might freak some people out, but to be honest, I think that in the bigger picture, this is a great thing for applicants. I think that it will help people to exercise better judgment about whether they're ready to take the test and whether to take it. I think that a lot of people have been postponing actually going to law school because they keep thinking, well, wait, what if I take that LSAT one more time in, in September? What if I take it one more time in October? What if I do this? What if I, and they're, they're very scared to kind of let it go and move on with their lives. Um, I also, obviously, this levels the playing field in terms of people who actually have the time to keep taking, keep studying for the LSAT, not to mention the money to keep applying and, and keep studying and keep using tutors and what have you. Uh, there, there really shouldn't be a reason to have to take the LSAT six times. Um, and I, I really challenge people to exercise good judgment about when and whether to take the test, the same way that I do about exercising good judgment about where you're applying, given your goals and credentials, uh, you know, what you're submitting with your applications. I mean, we're doing this for a reason. We're doing this to enter a profession, right? And that profession is all about people of good judgment, hopefully. So this is good practice. <laughs> I agree. I think that the L taking the LSAT becomes almost like an addiction. It's a sport. People, yeah, it is, it is yeah. Sport. It's a competitive sport. You're playing yeah. against yourself, but it's like people who run dozens of marathons. You know, go do that. Um, yeah. That's my speed. Like, go do that. That's generally healthy and um no, you know i think that that that's a better place to put that energy i think that um taking the else having the opportunity to take the outside an unlimited number of times feeds anxiety feeds that um if people lose uh, their eyes not on the ball in terms of what's really important in this process, the LSAT is not the end game. The LSAT is the means to the end. And so get it done, move on. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities to do that on lots of schedules as opposed to before when you had to pick a very selective three or four times a year, because I say three because February was never a good choice. Um, but now, you know, you can choose on your schedule. If you have a busy summer, no big deal. You know, November instead of December, that's to the applicant's advantage, that's a little earlier. I think that um, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that you always can withdraw the day before if you don't feel right. ready. You can postpone. Which is new it. too. I mean, that's a relatively yeah. new thing. I mean, LSAC has been trying to be more student friendly. Yeah, and it's, I think it's, it's a great really example. Nice. It's really nice. Yeah. And also, if you're not ready in September, 
you can take it in October or take That's it right. in November or take it in right. January. It's being offered, yeah. I think, 10 times a year yeah. going forward. And there's not really a reason to take it more than seven times in your lifetime anyway. <laughs> you know, that's, I think anyone except, no one except those who work in the industry like myself would ever think to do something like that, which is why they're also not letting you take it if you've already gotten no 180. Yeah. <laughs> they, Good they don't want people ruining the curve. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah I, I think honestly, just take it when you're ready. Don't take it as a dry run just to see how you'll do. Obviously, people could do that in July because July doesn't count towards the ultimate count. But going forward, you can always take a proctored exam offered by a prep company. You could take one online. Khan Academy has them as well. And that really should be sufficient just to see yeah. what it's like. You can even go on familiar.lsac.org and play around with the digital LSAT familiarization tool working That's with That's actually stuff I wanted to ask you. I want to ask you, you know, if people ask me what are the best... Uh, ways to practice and get used to the digital format, where would you point them? I would say first step is familiar.lsac.org. I just put the link in the, in the chat here. Basically, yeah. LSAC has offered three different LSAT prep tests in the digital format. So get a tablet if you can. You don't have to, but if you have one available to you, it's a great option. LSAC is using a Microsoft Surface Go 10 inch. You can use any old tablet. It'll be perfectly fine. You could get an Amazon Fire tablet for around $150 and then return it after the test if you decide that it's not for you. Otherwise, just use the desktop version and that'll be sufficient or use the PDFs if you have access to them, put them up on your computer screen, have some scratch paper to the side. The biggest change is that you won't be able to draw freehand on the questions the way you can on a prep book or a piece of paper. And so have your scratch paper to the side. LSAC will give you about 14 pages of scratch paper to use and you can draw your, all your diagrams and notes there. The screen will be somewhat clean. You can underline and highlight, but that's about it. And that's really all you need to do. The content is not changing at all, so I don't really want to overemphasize yeah. the changes that are happening. It's still games, reasoning, reading comp, experimental. The nicest thing, I think, is that the writing sample is no longer at the test center. I know. You can that's do pretty that, exciting. You can do that at home, not even the same day, so not when your brain's fried. You can do it yeah. fresh and type not writing by hand, which by the way, leads me to ask you, Anne, what do you think about admission officers looking at the writing sample now that it's going to be typed? So it's interesting. It's, it's, um, I have always felt that writing samples are really only important in the case of where, what, if a law school would wonder whether someone's English abilities were really their own. And especially with so many applicants from China in recent years, um, I'll be honest, uh, my applicants from China are the most challenging with writing generally. Uh, especially if they were educated abroad and not in the U.S. So I think that people whose first language isn't English, that's a good example of someone whose writing sample is going to be scrutinized generally, whether it's the old way or the new way. I think that this will uh, make it easier because you'll do the writing sample once and you don't have to redo it again. So there'll just be one. I hope that it makes applicants pay a little bit more attention to it because I think often they have disregarded it and poo-pooed it and kind of glossed over and not really cared. And I think in this new way, they will be more inclined to make it part of their application. I'm hoping law schools pay attention to it. Uh, but really in the end, it's only going to be something that a law school admission officer is going to look at if there's some question mark about whether someone's written materials were either really written by them or if they were written poorly, you know, poorly, but it doesn't match other things. You know, it, it's kind of, if there's a question mark, I still don't think it's something that's going to be a game changer for people in getting into a law school or not. That makes a lot of sense. So I, I kind of get the sense that the writing sample could hurt you if you're not a good writer or if English is not, you're not too strong in English, but Correct. if you're a native English speaker, it's probably not going to push you over the edge. Correct. Absolutely. Um, there's a question uh, in the chat about how the LSAT score might be compared for international students versus U.S. students. If you're an international student who, who attended a university ab abroad that your GPA can't be counted by LSAC in, in, in the GPA, then your LSAT score is the only thing you've got to show how you would compete with the school student body. So it does become very important. Um, it's also a side note, if your undergraduate degree doesn't count toward a GPA for the law schools, it's harder to be competitive for scholarships as well, uh, because the whole point of giving scholarships is to 
boost numbers. But I think uh, it might seem like we're paying undue attention to, you know, too much attention to international applicants, but really it's a huge growth area uh, despite recent immigration policies. Uh, it's a huge area of, of growth. So I think it's important to put more information out in the universe about it. No, thanks for clearing that up. Yeah, it seems yeah. that the LSAT score would be the only objective numerical measure Correct. a law school can rely upon when they're not familiar with the situation overseas and LSAC is not giving or even calculating a GPA at all. Correct. And how you would compare versus other uh, the people you're going to be sitting in a law school classroom with. How, can you compete academically? Is your English at that level? Is your comprehension at that level? So, so it's very important. Right, right. Oh, by the way, one other thing I should mention regarding the digital LSAT, since we were Please. discussing it, is that this is only happening in North America right now. This is not happening for international applicants. So anyone tuning in from overseas, if you're in Asia, Africa, Latin America, this is not applying to you. And it, it'll probably take at least a few years for LSAC to bring the digital format overseas as well. They're starting off in North America, then bringing it abroad. And so that means that for anyone in North America who wants to avoid the digital LSAT, you could go overseas. I'm yeah, not that's I'm kind not of desperate. I, I generally recommend <laughs> don't take the LSAT in Seoul or Beijing. Um, no, but no. you have to. Yeah. <laughs> There's also jet lag. It's, I, I think the, the perils of that probably outweigh the, uh, any potential benefit. But that's yeah, a def good. Definitely not worth it unless you're a total tech nip open and have a lot of time to spare. <laughs> yeah. We got another question here from the audience. How do letters of rec work? Do the people we are asking have to make an LSAC account? or are they supposed to mail them to LSAC? Oh, great question. So it's actually super easy at remembering the olden days when it wasn't, trust me, super easy. So uh, you go into your LSAC account, you enter the names and contact information for your recommenders. You check the box saying you waive your right to see the letter. If they show it to you separately, it's okay, but check the box. Then LSAC sends them an email with instructions on how to upload their letter, easy. The, my favorite part of the process, which I'm knocking on wood, they don't change. Ever, so maybe I shouldn't put this out in the universe, is that um, your recommenders will never know if you end up using their letter. So with each application, you check which, you, you literally check the box of which letters go with that application. So you might have someone you're not sure how great their letter is going to be. You can kind of decide later whether to use it and they'll never know. Uh, you just don't check the box attaching it to any specific school's letter uh, application. Interesting. Oh, that's very cool. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. So given that, let's say someone might have four people to ask and then select two or three of them to submit to different law schools. Do you ever recommend for your clients that they kind of customize which letters go to which schools based on certain unique characteristics? Yes, it is sometimes. Some schools specifically ask for uh, work references, especially for people who've been out of school more than two years. Um, and they might, and, and some schools say we require an academic letter, although that's rare and, and the word require usually isn't that hard. It's usually something softer than that, like we recommend. Um, and uh, there may also be a case where someone's writing a letter because they have a connection to that school, like your boss went to that law school. And so you can actually have a sep have the boss upload two letters, one where she's writing uh, to law schools generally and one where she's writing to the law school you're applying to that she's affiliated with. You can make sure that the correct letter goes to that school. So in that way, you would customize it. Interesting. Oh, thanks for sharing that. And one other idea that's occurred to me is that sometimes folks have someone famous or esteemed who's like a judge, but they don't really know them super well. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but we're, maybe not to, write no. the, not to write the Just letter. Just say no. It's not worth a letter. Ever. What about not a letter, but like a call to the office? A call to the office or an email to their contact at the law school would be appropriate after an application submitted, but um, not a letter of recommendation. Thanks for that. We actually got a question from the audience related. Why is it customary to waive the right to see the letter of recommendation? Well, it's because you have to assume that people write about you differently and the letter would be less candid if there's an expectation you would see it. Um, the waiving the right to see the letter is really about not suing LSAC or the law schools to see letters after the fact. This is, But if someone wants to show you a copy of the letter, they can do so. Um, it's not that you're saying you've never seen it, never read it. In fact, oftentimes people will ask you to write the first drafts of, of letters of rec, and that's okay nowadays. But there's some, I mean, faculty members, I think, still would frown upon being asked to see their letter. Like, you have 
the whole point is that we compromise integrity. So um, that's that's how, just how it's done. So let's say that someone does ask you, so you they, they ask the applicant, hey, could you draft something for me? I'm very busy. Could you draft something? How far can you go as an applicant and what, sh what should you do? Okay, so I have a lot about this in the book as well in law school admission game, but um, I generally you want to set up the writer's credibility first, how the person knows you in what context, and then have three to five paragraphs with examples of traits that you think that person can speak to, whether it's writing ability, trusted with clients, you know, professionalism, what have you, and include factual examples of those things. Um, and that it sh the letter should only address things that that person is actually qualified to state about you. It shouldn't pull in other things. Um, though that can be for your personal statement, but uh, it should be only things that the person is actually in a position to evaluate about you and to witness about you. Um, there's a mirror behind me and I see my daughter walking back and forth <laughs> in the mirror behind me, even though she's all the way on the other side. Um, sorry about the distraction. So anyway, um, so that, that's, that's how I would start a letter of recommendation someone asks you to do. And I would stay away from form letters online and copying them because it's, it's very obvious. You know, please feel free to contact me on my direct line at blah, 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 blah. It is a pleasure to recommend so-and-so. Like, use your own words. Well, that breaks it down pretty well. I really like the idea of like only speak about things that the recommender would have a credence to speak about things that they Correct. are qualified to speak about related to you. So limited yeah. the scope of what their professional contact has been with you or yes. academic contact has been. Yes. With you. What the person knows firsthand. Um, there's a, there's another question in the chat box. I see about wait lists. Uh, when do people stop at, at schools, uh, start, stop with their wait lists? Um, the first day of classes. <laughs> I don't know how else to answer that. Yeah. If you've been out of school for a couple years and you're reapproaching a faculty member, this is a great question. I get this a lot. I would start with email um, and reintroducing yourself, letting them know what you've done uh, since graduating, why you remember them. Maybe include a link to your LinkedIn or some other way to have a picture attached if you're not sure they'll remember you. And then let them know that you're thinking you're going to be applying to law school this cycle and you'd love to speak with them about it, see if they're open to the conversation. Is there anything that applicants could do, let's say if they graduate from undergrad and there's a few of a gap? that they could anything they could do to stay in touch with professors of course of course now mind you if you're not sure you're going to be applying to law school and you're graduating now or you're a year out reach out and get those letters sent to lsec now because lsec will hold them for five years so go ahead and get them um and i i think a smart thing to do would be to reach out to those professors every six months eight months but to be honest why bother? Just go ahead and get the letter, send it to LSAC, even if you're not sure when you'll be applying. So if the letter is you never dated, know what'll happen. So let's say the letter it's okay is dated. that it was dated older because yeah. the, the the purpose of that letter is to speak to who you were as a student. So who you were as a student in their classes hasn't changed since 2014. Then there's no reason to put a 2017 date. I mean, I'm using old dates, but you know what I mean. All that's happening is gonna happen yeah. is it's gonna get rusty and it'll be a better letter if they write it fresh while you're still a student. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's all going to be things you remind them of, and you're not going to still have copies of the papers you wrote for that person to send to them. I mean, no one keeps that stuff. So get the letter sooner. Oh, thanks. For the, yeah. I mean, I, I think as a student, you would even barely remember as well. If Correct. It's <laughs> yeah, if you've moved on. So I was interested with the wait list. That it re the wait list really, go, to go back to that, the wait list yeah. continues until the first day of classes. So you could hear back from schools in August in at mid-August even potentially. You could be at orientation for one school and get a call from another, but I don't want to get anyone's hopes up too much this cycle with wait lists. Um, well, I wouldn't say it's hopeless. I think a lot of schools are over-enrolled, oversubscribed, and heavy deposits are in. So unless a whole bunch of people at the top decide they're really going to work on election campaigns this fall and defer law school for a year, um, I think that keep trying for wait lists, but don't get your heart set on it. I don't anticipate a ton of movement. Not this cycle, but future this cycles. This cycle, it changes every cycle, school to school. There, there's no way of knowing. But my feeling right now is that wait lists are not going to move too, too terribly much. Okay, thanks for that. We got a question. Is there a way to update your transcript on LSAC? Yes, but you have to do it the same way that you sent the original transcript. So contacting your university, having Correct. that sent it over. All right, here's one from someone. Are some schools more or less receptive to 50-year-old applicants 
without respect to LSAT GPA? Would a high LSAT score change anything? Well, if your LSAT and GPA are in line for a school, then your age would be a benefit if you've done something useful with your time. Uh, you know, if you just the age itself is not really the issue. It's what you bring to the table. I mean, I had someone who was almost 50 who got into Harvard Law School who had 20 years of work experience, you know, as a police officer um, and then went back and got his PhD and now he's going to law school. So in that way, and he had the numbers, right? So obviously the age was not <laughs> a, 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 a negative for that candidate. I think that it gets harder. You know, many years ago, I had a client who she was in her uh, mid fifties and she'd been a stay at home mom and she was applying to law school and she wasn't trying to get into a, a top law school, but she was really worried that she really had nothing she felt on her resume. And she ended up uh, going to law school, opening her own law practice and doing very well. I think that it depends on your goals and where you want to be and how you present it. Um, I've also had, you know, um, if all you have is an LSAT score and your grades are not great and they're 35 years old and your um, your resume doesn't have too much on it that's impressive, just having an LSAT score in line is not going to be enough to save you uh, it, it, no matter what your age is. I think that it's also important for applicants that are older than most to have a reason that they're really selling the law school on for why this makes sense for them. You know, if you're someone who is needing a full scholarship to go to law school or, you know, you, you, you or you're saying that you want to work for big law, like th those just aren't reasonable things for someone at that age. Like you have to show that this makes sense for you, that you're putting your money where your mouth is. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What about, we got some more questions here. Okay. Does working full-time throughout college make up for a GPA below the 25th percentile? We'll okay, start let's, start, let's start with that. The other one could go on for years. Okay, yeah. um, so here's the thing. It depends how much lower your GPA is. Um, the fact that you work full-time during college is absolutely something, something law schools need to know and something they appreciate. It's... Um, it's part of the diversity you bring to the table. It shows a lot about your commitment to completing your degree. But if your GPA is a 2.0, it's hard to, sh and your LSAT's low, it's really hard to say that working service is gonna make up for that. If your GPA is in range and your LSAT's in range and you worked full time to put yourself through school, that's when it's impressive is to show how you overcome the obstacle, not just that you had the obstacle, so um, I don't mean to be a party pooper, but I think that it's that people often overestimate those things and they say, oh yeah, the, the 25th percentile GPA is a 3.3, mine's a 2.7, I'm close. It's not really close. Um, numerically, that's not close. Uh, so I think it's important to be realistic. Yeah, and it, it puts, it's, not, it's not that close. You want to show that you have the, you're going to have the ability to do the work. And correct. that is being able to slug it out for three years of law school. If you couldn't slug it out in undergrad, they're going to be concerned about law school. Now, working obviously helps, but then on the flip side, the other thing you can do is get the best LSAT score possible for yourself. It Absolutely. May, because that shows who you, what you're capable of today and, and that you'd be able to compete and that those grades aren't indicative of your intellectual abilities. So all of that is good. Now, I don't want to ignore the very important question of how much does being a URM play into admissions? Um, I won't be able to give it the gravitas it requires. <laughs> we, we have a short time frame here, but I, I would like to say this, that... If you're someone who has overcome significant socioeconomic challenges, um, and, and I'll throw out some examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but some people always ask me for examples. What does that mean, Anne? They think maybe their stories aren't quite enough. So, you know, if you were, if you were in foster care, if you had a single parent who struggled three jobs and you took care of younger siblings, if you... Uh, lived in a neighborhood with poor schools and resources that you had to overcome. You know, all of, all of these kinds of things, socioeconomic, you know, parents struggled or um, difficult circumstances, a parent was incarcerated, I mean, could be anything, you know, the, the sky's the limit or um, those are all things that impacted your ability to excel uh, or made you strive to excel more uh, that motivated you. Those kinds of things um, help a lot. Um, just simply checking a box is not something that's going to be a huge plus in today's day and age in the admission cycle because thankfully we're becoming more diverse as an as a profession and so um well there are definitely some aspects that are underrepresented in african-americans you know still 
really underrepresented in legal profession. Um, the, the URM angle really comes into play when you show the background that you came from, and it, it's not just about the obstacles you faced, but how you overcame them. So one thing to keep in mind is if you're writing a diversity statement, to focus it on your story and your perspective rather than your parents or grandparents. And that's a good way to test whether uh, it, it, being a URM is really going to be a factor in your application. Yeah, I was thinking the diversity statement's the key place to talk yeah. about yourself personally, but put another angle on it. Correct. Or we've got some more here. Okay. How would you factor in completing 65 credits of dual enrollment credit graduating early with a 365 GPA from a Big Ten college? How would admissions factor that in? Okay, so I'm not going to answer that as specifically. I, I am getting a lot of people who are graduating early applying to school. I've even spoken with a couple of 19-year-olds in the last couple of weeks who are graduating from college. And I, the way I want to answer that is this, that the, the fact that you completed college early, great, wonderful, make sure it's apparent in your application. But sometimes, um, now you're saying you have five years of work experience, and that's probably more important than, than the dual uh, enrollment credit. You know, sometimes people mention dual enrollment credit in an addendum to show that their grades in high school weren't as strong as their grades once they got the hang of things. I mean, at 16, they weren't as prepared as they were at 18 or 19. And so it kind of depends how it impacted you and how that factored into your 3.65 and what your major is and all of that. But um, there's a lot of ways to address that. It doesn't necessarily require an addendum for everyone. It, it can simply be on your resume. You put under education, under your bachelor's degree, graduating two and a half years. Yeah. Oh, I love this question. I want to answer this one. When do you know if your personal statement should be your diversity statement and vice versa? This is interesting because for some schools, I have people swap, which is which, <laughs> depending on what the prompt says. So you might do that too. So here's the thing. The there's a couple ways of doing it. If your diversity statement is about things that pretty much end before you're an adult, then it should be a diversity statement. If your diversity statement is something that's been since you've been an adult, so for example, some hardships since you've been an adult, whether, um, you know, uh, let's say um, uh, being a victim of a crime, okay, uh, and overcoming that. That might be a personal statement versus a diversity statement, especially if it segues into your current career goals and things you've done since. So, but one easy way to compart <gasps> sorry about the dog. One easy way to compartmentalize your story is whether you whether the story was from before uh, before college. If it was from before college, you probably used it for college admissions. Let's not use it for law school admissions. Let's show who you are today. That's a really cool distinction. Very simple rule of thumb breaking it down, adult versus childhood, where to put yep. which one. Yep. I would imagine also uh, having a positive spin versus a negative spin is also something important to discuss when it comes to dealing with obstacles. What are your thoughts on that? So uh, here's the thing. I, I don't ever want to impose my voice on someone else's story. If there's not a positive takeaway, let's not pretend there is one. However, if the prompt you're answering is obstacles overcome, really focus on the overcoming and not, yes, you want to provide enough credence to what you're stating your obstacles were. I never want someone to write a diversity statement that says, I faced obstacles, but here's all the things I did to overcome them. You have to give the reader, you have to earn some credibility with the reader and give some idea of what those obstacles were that you were facing. And then talk about the steps you took to overcome them. Um, because that's really the impressive part, you know? Um, Someone who just has a string of misfortunes, the law schools are not, that alone doesn't really show them that you're going to be okay in law school and in the profession. And so while we want to diversify the law school environment, the perspective that's offered there and in the profession, we need to know you, you overcame something and it's not just a string of um, things that happened to you. Right. Yeah. They don't want to worry that you're going to have, keep having bad things happen to you. Right. And it's hard to say that to people, but it's, it's true. I mean, remember, if you are someone who's had a lot of just really crappy shit to deal with, then I would say choose selectively what you are going to talk about um, in your diversity statement, which of those experiences were most impactful and have the biggest takeaway uh, for you, as opposed to stating every little thing. And to be honest, like if some of them don't reflect that well on you, um, and they're not necessary to the story, like you're showing constant bad judgment and choosing, you know, the people that you're in relationships with. And so you're constantly a, a victim of domestic violence, maybe focus on one of those aspects um, 
and, and that was a, and, and show some distance since then. Or I mean, I hate to make up stories, but that's one example. How about this one, advantages of applying early in the cycle? So by early in the cycle, I'm going to say Thanksgiving, okay? Statistically, at the same schools, you'll get better results by applying before Thanksgiving-ish, okay? I don't want to say exactly November 23rd or whenever Thanksgiving is, but Thanksgiving-ish, okay? Your application is complete by then. I consider you having the best possible run at this admission cycle with the best possible results given your credentials and applications. Um, once we start getting later through the holidays, January, February, scholarship offers, all of that stuff, more wait listing, all of that comes into play, uh, especially because you know applications were up 8% this cycle. And I, I do expect a, a solid state status there. I don't think things will go back down. So if anything, they'll go up. And election year is always interesting when people are um, thinking about applying to law school because sometimes they get very motivated to apply and sometimes they wait to apply because they're involved in the campaign. So we'll see how that impacts things. But anyway, early, that's, that's my timeline for earlier. There's never a reason that you have to submit an application on September 1st. Well, There's what, no advantage to that. What September, about the advantages October in terms 1st, of scholarship money? September 1st, October 1st, November 1st, no difference. January, February, big difference. Yeah, less scholarship money available. And Absolutely. Not. Yeah, they've given it away and they don't know yet who's accepting. So they get a little scared. Yeah. Yeah. What about early decision? How yeah. does that help? So it depends on the school. Um, I really caution people. I know early decision for people who've applied to college in the last five to seven years is like a thing um, that is really strategic and, and really increases their chances of getting the attention of a college. But for law school, I only want people to do that if they're 100% sure that the school they're applying to is the place they would go no matter what. And by no matter what, I mean if they got in somewhere better, better, or if they got a scholarship somewhere not as good, but suddenly their financial situation changes. I mean, I've had people, I had someone who started a cycle telling me, Anne, I just want to get into a T14. What's my best shot at a T14? This person had a 4.0, awesome work experience and a one, high 150s LSAT. Looking at her, this, I picked a school in the top 10 that I felt she would have a good go at if she applied binding. She did. And then she panicked because she didn't know how to pay for it. She ended up not going. She ended up not going to law school because she'd applied binding. She couldn't go somewhere else if she applied binding there. And it was really awful. Uh, so I don't want people to use binding to game the system unless they've got the money in the bank to pay for law school and they're sure. Um, because it's, it's really devastating when that doesn't work. Um, but I would, you know, in the way that I described, but if there's a school, and also some schools that can be more competitive binding if a scholarship comes with the binding option. So for example, UT Northwestern have sometimes offered these binding um, arrangements where it comes with a lot of money, which means it might be more competitive to get in for that. So it's not necessarily a ticket in. This year, um, you know, it used to be that Georgetown, the numbers were vastly different for binding versus non-binding, but they are narrowing that gap. This year, I saw that gap narrowed. It used to be if I had an awesome person with an awesome GPA, great background, amazing military, whatever, and then a 151, 152, 153, they applied binding to Georgetown, they could get in. I have not seen that recently. Wow. But I really want to emphasize the point you made about, about scholarship negotiation power. If you apply binding, you kind of, you lose, None. you lose your leverage and negotiating None. scholarships is, is huge. But it's not just the negotiating aspect of it. It's the, what if you really change your mind, you get your head turned by another school. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't think you'd go to that school, but sometimes people's financial situations change. Maybe they end up going through a divorce. Maybe their parents end up going through a divorce. Suddenly the money they thought was going to be there isn't there. They could have taken this other scholarship. Yeah, I just saw I this email that went out. Yeah. I mean, applicants should keep their minds open. I see people change 180 degrees from September and what they think they want out of the cycle to August when they're ready to start law school. And it's almost always what they're turning on is they think ranking is less important and financial is more important. Every time. Every time someone changes 180 degrees, that's what it is. Well, it's funny because you're suddenly thinking, how am I actually going to pay for this? You're starting to think about what that tuition bill is going to look like. It's real. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's important to think about it earlier rather than later. 
We got one more question here on admissions about okay. applying while you're in college versus after you've graduated. How does that change how law schools might look at an applicant? Okay, so the only time that there's an advantage to waiting to after you graduate to apply is if you really need those senior year grades to help show an upward trend and improve your GPA. Otherwise, there's zero difference in outcomes um, because by the time you apply the next year, you only have three months of work experience, which you've usually spent studying for the LSAT. So it's, it's, it's not an important differentiator. It's only something I, if you're only going to be out one year, it's usually uh, something I would only advocate because you need improved grades or LSAT score. Mm, yeah, thanks for that. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. All right, we'll or move. better letters of rec. Ooh, yeah. Get more time to get good letters. Maybe yes. an employer. Not an employer, you'd be there three months, but maybe a professor from professor. senior year where you're taking an upper level seminar and it would be a more meaningful letter. Right. Right. Higher level class. Yeah. We've got one last one and we can wrap up on that. And this person's asking, what would it look like if we wanted to work with you, Anne, during the <laughs> What a great question to finish. <laughs> okay. That's uh, whoever asked that, I'll, I'll uh, take care of you later. No. Um, okay. So I have a website, uh, lawschoolexpert.com. There's also a blog, YouTube channel, all that stuff. But the lawschoolexpert.com is really focused on my consulting packages, how I work with people, testimonials, and how things break down. I do have a contact form there. So if you fill it out and you can say in the comments that you met me tonight uh, through the webinar and I get in touch with everyone personally. So sometimes I do kind of tell people, ooh, you're not quite ready for me. Let's talk after LSAT or what have you. But for the most part, I get in touch with everyone personally. I'm the only person here, as you can see, I'm working in my living room tonight. So um, I, I get in touch with everyone. You can also check out the Law School Expert blog, uh, which I've been keeping since 2006. So there's a lot of stuff there. And I do check the comments every few weeks and respond to all of them. Perfect. I've just put the link to your site and in the Thank comments you. here, lawschoolexpert.com. Great. I'll share with folks our previous conversation we did a few months back on YouTube okay. and on the LSAT Unplugged podcast as well. And I'm going to share with, with folks a few links to some things I put together. I actually just put started in Instagram and and we just, I did too. Yeah, Someone just, told me I had to have a law school expert Instagram. And oh, was yours new also? I just was like looking for also, you. Law school expert at Instagram. And um, it's funny, I, I've always done Instagram, like kept that my personal thing or like for my running or whatever. And then someone's like, you know, and you really need one for law school expert. So now I have one. In fact, I should take a picture of this conversation and then I'll Instagram story it. Ta-da. And there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, that's great. We need to up our follower counts. I just started mine. I have like less than 30 followers and I'm like, all right, well, I'll work on that. We have, to, we have to boost it up. I so like everyone, projects. <laughs> Yeah, everyone oh, watching yeah. this, yeah, follow us on Instagram, help us boost our follower accounts and get Insta-famous. This is a lot of fun. God forbid. <laughs> the last thing I need is Insta-famous, but my, my eight, daughter who's going into eighth grade is a great coach on the fact that I'm not using my stories and videos very well, and I need to, need to improve that. All right, well, hopefully she'll be able to give you my some My social guidance. media consultant. <laughs> yeah. yes. All right, well, I'll watch what you're doing through her guidance. Okay. <laughs> Hey, she might be hireable. I'll talk yeah, to her. I'll check her out. <laughs> Instaexpert.com. <laughs> she's, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> she's, she's very open. So anyone needs a, an eighth grader to do their social media, contact me. Awesome. All right. And well, this was a pleasure. Thanks so much for doing this again. Thanks for having me. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.